In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Have you ever planned a wedding? <laughs> yeah. If so, you may have some idea of all the ins and outs, the absolute wonder, and the many pitfalls that such a day involves. My two daughters, bless their hearts, chose to get married the same summer, one in June, one in August. One wedding was here in Southern California, near where my older daughter lives, the other near San Francisco, where my younger daughter lives. To say the least, it was a challenge. When and where to have the ceremony and the reception, who to invite, and the always challenging question of who to sit where at the reception. <laughs> But all of that was nothing compared to a wedding in the first century Mediterranean world. Who was invited, who sat where, was a big deal. Where you were seated at a wedding or a dinner party conveyed honor and status, primary values in this culture. The seating at a meal both conveyed honor and was a tool. If you hosted a dinner party and wanted an advantageous marriage with a certain young man for your daughter, you could seat his father at a higher place at the table than he usually would have. If a competitor in business had shorted you in a deal, you could seat him lower at the table to communicate your displeasure. Seating at the table was currency and was on the stage on which political and social relationships were played out. It was the public display of an individual's or a family's place on the spectrum of honor and shame. Jesus had been invited to dine with the Pharisees. It almost feels like a setup. Luke tells us that they were watching him closely, almost anticipating that something untoward would happen, and it did. Jesus, noticing how each person at the dinner tried to elbow his way into the seat of honor, told two stories about wedding banquets. The Pharisees wanted to know who Jesus was. To do that, they had to know where he stood on the honor scale. That ranking determined with whom you associated, how you treated someone, and how you expected to be treated by them. We don't have exact parallels, but it's a little like a room full of people today. When the boss comes in, you tend to act one way to say certain things. When the person who delivers the mail to each office comes in, the response is different. Over and over in the Gospels, people ask the same kinds of questions about status, about hierarchy and position. How do you measure these? And thus, how do you order your world? Where do they and where do I fit into the scheme of things? But Jesus did not answer in these terms. Jesus was not trying to set up a new set of hierarchies. Notice that in the two stories he tells, he does not say, get rid of this whole scheme of things. His words assume that the world will continue to work and live within this system, as we do, not exactly in the same way as the first century, first century Mediterranean world, but we still jockey for positions in our world. Endless competition for the right place at work, for the right college, to live in the right neighborhood. The unspoken cues and subtle put-downs. The unfairness of who is rewarded and who is shoved down to a lower rung. Who gets served first when there is a line? Whom do we greet first when we encounter a group of people? Jesus does not get rid of the system. But what if he's asking us to work from a different set of assumptions, to ask different questions? When you are invited, go and sit at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. To seat yourself at the place of honor assumes that you have that honor, that status, that you have earned the right to sit in the best place. By whatever criteria you use, family name, income, accomplishments, being righteous, 
Whatever those criteria are, the implication is that you earn a place at this table, and by extension at the heavenly banquet. You deserve that invitation to the banquet. But what if we asked a different question? What if we were freed from the rat race to the never-ending necessity to prove ourselves, both to others and to ourselves? As long as our satisfaction comes from putting ourselves above others, we might find ourselves with many shining things and diplomas and titles, but cold and empty hearts. What if the questions were more like, how can I be sure that everyone gets an invitation to the banquet? Could I stop looking for every opportunity at work to exalt myself and look instead for ways to lend a hand? How can I live my life so that I'm genuinely pleased to see a variety of people sitting in church? How can I learn that including everyone does not devalue my invitation? What if we were really to believe that God's love is poured out in more abundance than we could imagine, that there is enough for us and for all? God's love is not something we have to hoard, not something for which we have to push our way to be first in line, lest we miss out. We are loved with such abundance, and we are called to share that love. This week, you are invited to do that in a simple and concrete way. This is your cue. On Tuesday morning, following the Eucharist, the group brought in various items, socks, water, snack bars, toothbrushes, toothpaste, and the like, and put them together. Don't go away. Don't go away yet, please. <laughs> the Tuesday morning group put these bags together, and we're going to bless them, and then we're going to pass them out. So each person gets one. You're invited to give them to somebody who is in need. And thank you, Tuesday morning folk, for doing this. So let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, your love for humanity was revealed in Jesus, whose earthly life began in the poverty of a stable. We remember before you those who are unhoused or without food. Help us to see each person as your beloved child. Bless these bags, we pray, the hands that prepared them, the hands that will distribute them, the hands that will receive them. May they be a tangible sign of your love, which embraces us all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now. <laughs> I invite each of you to take a bag. Keep it in your car, if you wish. And when you see someone in need, please give it to them. And as you do, See that person as the beloved child of God. lesson today, the writer gives a whole list of things that we might do. Knowing the love of God translates into living that love and sharing that love. The writer says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Be content with what you have. Offer a sacrifice of praise to God. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. Perhaps a tall order to do all that, but we move forward with the assurance that we are not alone. We have a community of faith here at St. Michael's to walk with. We have the assurance that God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. 
so that we may say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. I will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.